And uh, so next, let me introduce uh, very fast Mattia Conte. Mattia uh, will go on the biological side of statistical mechanics. So let me introduce him a moment. So uh, he's now a postdoctoral researcher with Professor Di Codemi in Naples. He works in statistical mechanics, uh, complex system, and clearly applied to molecular biology. And uh, um, he has been working in collaboration with Humboldt University, Max Delbruck Center, uh, French Institute of Human Genetics. Uh, and today he will introduce for us polymer models uh, to try to understand chromosome three-dimensional organization, which is an important task. Like for Federica, I will tell you after 20 minutes. Okay, thank you, go ahead. Yeah. Yes, thank you for the introduction. Can you see the full screen and also my arrow? Yes, I can see the full screen and yes, I can see the arrow. Yes, thank you. OK, it's brilliant. So thanks again for the introduction and for inviting me today for this talk. So today I want to discuss with you our recent work made in polymer physics to try to understand the, the mechanism, I mean the, the physical and molecular mechanisms that shape the folding of the human genome in 3D space, say in both health and uh, in disease. Now I want to start with a few very basic concepts from molecular biology about DNA, because as you know DNA, uh, I mean if you open the textbook of molecular biology, DNA is a, a linear string, a linear sequence, which is made of a three billion of letters. Technically they are called bases and are indicated as A, G, C and T. And now you know that along this linear sequence, there are specific regions that I highlighted in red in this slide, which are called the genes. Now, the genes contain, simply contain the information to produce the protein, which are the building blocks essential for the life and the functioning of the cells. And now, quite curious, and if you want peculiar fact, is the following. In, in the human genome, there are roughly 20,000 genes, and if you put one after the other, those genes, you cover, say, more or less the 2% of the entire DNA length. So this means that the vast majority of our DNA, uh, so the 98%, say, it's non-coding DNA because it's not made of genes and it's not used by the cell to produce the proteins. And so for that reason, in the past, there was a kind of bias in the scientific community because people were only focused on the genes, which are, of course, super important. And they somehow disregarded the non-coding DNA, which was even called at the very beginning junk DNA because it was thought to serve no purpose at all. But such a perspective is now dramatically changed because we are uh, say, starting to understand that the non-coding DNA is, is really crucial as well because it hides, it contains the secret of how the genes are regulated. And the picture, uh, which is emerging right now thanks to novel quantitative data that I'm going to discuss in a while, is the following. I try to summarize in this cartoon in this slide. So as you can see in the non-coding DNA, there are specific regions, color or green in this side, that are called regulators. Uh, say the point is that the regulators can activate a distal target gene, as you can see here, by looping onto the gene itself. So by establishing with the gene in 3D space a physical specific contact. And what is impressive is that uh, those regulators typically can be very, very far from their target gene. So for instance, they can be uh, one mega basis away along the linear sequence, which means one million basis or letters away uh, with respect to their target gene. And so one possible question is how these regulators in the darkness of the, say, crowded nuclear environment can recognize and identify their target gene and establish such a specific long range, say, control and uh, interaction. Of course, uh, I mean, uh, this happens not only for one gene and one regulator, but of course for all the 20,000 genes that we have in our genome in each cell simultaneously. So you can imagine how complex is the network of the contacts established between regulators and gene. So how complex is the folding of DNA in 3D space to accomplish all such a specific regulation? And so the two, say, important questions that, that, that I want to tackle now are the following. First of all, I mean, there are, uh, are there now quantitative data on those contacts? Can we measure those, say, gene regulatory interactions? And second 
question, which is most, say, challenging for us as physicists, is uh, uh, what is the mechanism underlying the folding of the genome? Okay, so uh, what are the molecular mechanisms shaping the, those contacts and this type of folding? So let's start with uh, the first point. I mean, the quantitative data that nowadays we have on those contacts. Indeed, as you can see, uh, say from this reference 2009, in the very last 10 years, there have been major advances in the field of molecular biology, whereby nowadays we have the technologies to quantitatively measure the contacts between gene regulators and in general between any pair of sites along a chromosome of our genome. One of these techniques, which I discuss with much more detail now, is called IC. Okay, you can see in the middle of my slide the typical output of, uh, of an IC experiment, which is a map of contact. In this case, I'm showing you the IC map of the contacts of the human chromosome 14. This is just an example, of course. On the x-axis and on the y-axis of this map, you can see the simply the there are simply the genomic coordinates of the chromosome that we are considering. And each entry of this map uh, measures how many times in a population of identical cells, uh, two sites, say the red sites and the, the green sites, are found close to each other. Now, close to each other means that the special distance between those sites is less than a given threshold, which in the real experiment is roughly 100 nanometer. So this means that each beam, each entry of this map, uh, is the average contact frequency between, say, in general, to any pair of sites belonging to the chromosome. So you understood that uh, those are really, say, fantastic data because in this map is somehow encoded also the information, uh, the quantitative information on the contacts between gene and, say, their distal regulators. And uh, if you take a closer look to this map, you can clearly see that there are specific patterns uh, of interactions because, for instance, there are regions on the chromosome 14 which interact much more frequently with each other. Okay, they are colored in, in a strong red. And you can also see that there are instead wider regions where interactions are depleted. And those blocks of, uh, of interactions of contacts, which are not random, of course, extend through all the scale of the chromosome. If you take a zoom within this matrix, so you take a sub-region of the entire, say, length of the chromosome, uh, strikingly, you can see that those patterns are still there, are still observed from the experimental side. Uh, say, for example, this blue region tends to strongly interact with itself and less with the other adjacent domain. And so it is like that uh, the tower genome at this scale, uh, which is the mega base scale, is divided into blocks of interactions, which are technically called the TADS by biologists, which means topologically associating domains. Uh, of course, this is, uh, say, only the, the first layer of a much more complex organization, because as you can see, and as I told you, the patterns extend through all the scale of the chromosome. So this means that different blocks, different TADS can also interact one with the other, giving rise to much more complex higher order structures that are called metatad. And we also showed in previous papers that there is a hierarchical organization of metatads that build up up to the chromosome scale. And so the big message I want to stress in, in, this, in this slide is the following. There are now quantitative data on the contacts between chromosomal uh, regions and the, in the emerging picture, our chromosome, the human chromosome, have a very complex 3D organization as revealed by those complex patterns of contacts. Okay, and so now the big question I want to, I want to try to tackle in, in this talk is the following. I mean, what is the origin of those contact patterns? What are the mechanisms underlying the formation of those contacts? Of course, as physicists, we won't try to, uh, say, tackle this point by using quantitative methods from physics, also because at the end of the day, DNA is a polymer. And so we believe that we can use principal models from polymer physics uh, to try to understand something about how the system self-organizes. Uh, say the picture about uh, uh, the folding that we proposed is summarized in the top of this slide. It's pretty, say, basic and simple. It's the typical take of a physicist, if you want, because if there are two distal objects, say a regulator and the gene, which engage in a long distance specific contact, uh, this means that uh, there is a particle that produces the interaction. Of course, this is not an elementary particle, but it will be a molecule or a protein which can bridge distal site along the, the chromosome filament. And so can bring, can bring in close partial proximity those distal sites. Uh, now let's try to 
translate this basic biological scenario of contact formation into a quantitative polymer model, so from polymer physics. Uh, I want to discuss first a basic, very basic toy polymer model, which uh, we can uh, make slightly more sophisticated step by step and, until we can say, explain real data. And so in this toy model, uh, this means that a chromosome region can be represented as a polymer chain, as you can see, which is made of bits that cannot overlap one with the other. And all along the polymer chain, there are special sites, specific sites uh, that I colored in red, which simply are the binding sites for the diffusing molecular binders of this polymer model. The binders are diffusing brown particles, which can bridge their cognate sites on the chain. Now, this system, which is made of the polymer and their cognate binders, of course, is subject to a classical equation of motion, so say to a Langevin dynamics, and the potential of this model are quite known and well established in classical polymer physics studies. So, for example, we have some potentials that make up the backbone of the polymer. So, technically, we have a an elastic fan potentials and a repulsive Leonard John term potential to avoid the overlap between the bits. Of course, uh, to simulate the attractive interactions between binding sites and binders, we have an attractive Leonard John's like potential. Now, uh, say, what is known in polymer physics is that uh, if you wait enough time, okay, and you let this system evolve, uh, say, under the fundamental equation of motions, then this system uh, do not fall in any possible state because the equilibrium conformation of this polymer model fold in conformational classes that correspond to its emergent thermodynamic phases. To be a bit more clear, uh, you can see the phase diagram of this simple polymer model that I'm discussing now. This is called the SBS polymer model, which is uh, the acronym for strings and binders, because we only have two basic ingredients, the polymer string and the molecular binders in the theory. Okay, the, the phase diagram is controlled by two parameters uh, that are on the x-axis, the binder concentration, which is simply the number of the binders floating around the polymer, and on the y-axis, the energy affinity of those binders in KB units. Uh, the energy affinity is simply the energy whereby the binders establish a physical contact on the chain. On the chain. So the energy uh, whereby they bridge distal sites on the chain. Of course, uh, what do you expect? I mean, if the number of the binders is too low or the energy is too small, the binders do not manage to stably fold the polymer chain, which instead, for entropic reason, uh, prefers to stay rather in a much more open, randomly folded conformation, which is called the coil state of the theory. And it has been shown that this coil phase is uh, simply falls in the universality class of the free self avoiding book, which is, as you know, the, uh, the standard polymer model of non interacting system in polymer physics. Uh, but if you increase the number of the binders, or you increase the, uh, say, the energy affinity of those binders, there is a precise threshold above which the binders do manage to stably fold the polymer chain into a much more compact close conformation that is the global phase of the theory. And so, in other words, the SBS model undergoes a thermodynamic phase transition from a coil to a global state. And so if we take this seriously, uh, I mean, this means that by determining the thermodynamic phases of the system, say coil a globule, which can be predicted by physics, we can derive from first principles, the statistical ensemble of 3D conformations where the system spontaneously falls into. And also since everything is based on a mechanism of phase transition, this also means that the folding of the polymer chain can be sharply controlled. I mean, the conformational changes of the polymer are controlled in a switch-like manner because we don't need any parameter fine-tuning, molecular fine-tuning. We only need to stay above or below the threshold line. Okay, and so suppose to take this seriously, this basic toy model, and let's make a basic, very basic variant of this toy model I discussed. So we can consider a, an SBS toy model where now we have two distinct types of binding sites. So we have the red sites as before on, on the chain, but we are also adding now on the right hand part of the polymer, some green binding sites. Around the polymer, we put some red binders and green binders. And again, the rule is that the red binders can only bridge red sites on the chain, and the green binders can only bridge green uh, binding sites, cognate green binding sites on the chain. So again, if you wait enough time, uh, as you may expect, the equilibrium conformation of this system is something like that. I mean, the polymers spontaneously will form two distinct lumps in 3D space, two distinct globules. And if in this system you map the contacts, 
you clearly will see two square blocks of interactions along the diagonal that at least visually resemble the contact domains that people commonly refer to as tasks, as I told you from IC data in my previous slide. And so the molecular mechanism envisaged by this polymer model to form contact is technically called in polymer physics polymer phase separation, because you see the polymer itself is making a phase separation, a micro phase separation, in two distinct phases, in two distinct globules. And each globule is, uh, say, produced by the abundance of cognate binding sites on the polymer chain. So the message I want to stress here is that the mechanism envisaged by the model is a thermodynamic mechanism of phase separation, polymer phase separation, and it seems that this mechanism can at least qualitatively recapitulate the patterns observed in the data. Okay, but I don't want to give the impression now that everything is a toy model, uh, because I, I want to show you that uh, with this mechanism of polymer phase separation, but by considering much more complicated polymer models, so with more than two colors, so with many types of binding sites on the chain, you can really make sense of real data from a quantitative point of view. And so as an example, I want to show you the real data uh, of a, a real human genomic region. Uh, in particular, this is called the F4 region. It's a six megabase wide region of chromosome two in human say, cells. And the name comes from this gene, F4, which is really, really important, as I will uh, show you in, in one slide. Now, the experimental pattern from a real assay experiment is reported above. And as you can see, it's, it's quite, say, complex because you can distinguish, for instance, a big tad around the FF4 gene. There is also some inner structure inside this tad. You can see also other tads downstream, say, this region, and some, say, much more fleeting interaction on the left. Overall, this is, uh, say, in general, the typical complex pattern that we have in real observed data, so in, re in real experiment. And now, as you understood, I mean, the matrix that you see below is the matrix of contact for the same genomic region derived by our model, which recapitulates with pretty good accuracy, say, the experimental IC. And so, of course, in this case, the polymer model, as I told you, has many distinct types of binding sites, but it, it always, uh, say, um, it's based on this mechanism of polymer phase separation. Of course, the colors need to be properly arranged along the polymer chain in order to, uh, say, properly capture the nested and complex pattern of interaction that you see in the data. And so, to summarize the message I want to stress is that with polymer phase separation, but by taking say polymer models with more colors, with more types of binding sites, you can explain the data beyond the toy model with quantitative accuracy. Okay, there is at least maybe one technical question now, uh, which is the following. I mean, how you choose the colors and how many colors you need to explain the data? And so I want to quickly address this point uh, because we developed a method, which is a polymer recursive statistical inference method to accomplish this point. I mean, to infer the optimal polymer model that to, to best explain, say, some real data. And uh, in short, the algorithm is called Prisma, and uh, Prisma works in this way. You take as input the experimental IC contact map for the genomic region you are interested in. Then you start with a blank polymer model. Okay, this one, for instance, in this cartoon. You compute the map of the contacts of this blank polymer model with the polymer phase separation I discussed before, and you compare this matrix against the input. Of course, I mean, at the beginning, the agreement is not good because you started with a blank polymer model. So you change step by step, iteratively, the colors of the bits of your polymer until you get the optimal, which means the minimal set of binding sites that best explain the considered input. And now, so if we want to be, I mean, critical, and I come back to my previous slide, uh, the metrics that I shown you before from the model is technically a fit of the data, okay? Because we take as input the experiment with polymer phase separation, which in a way is not trivial, it's a, it's a mechanism. Uh, you can, I mean, recapitulate the pattern and you make the comparison against this, this input against IC. So yes, technically this is a fit of the data. But what I want to show you now in the rest part of my talk is that we can do much more than a simple fit because we can make predictions with those basic concepts of polymer physics and test model predictions against independent data. Uh, I just have the time to discuss maybe one or two application uh, because one way to make a stringent test of the theory could be, for instance, the following. Suppose to have the polymer model that you think is the, I mean, significant polymer model for uh, it's explaining it with good accuracy given genomic region. So you can make a mutation on this polymer system, which means, for instance, that you can implement a deletion. In other words, you cut out a piece of the polymer. 
then you, you can derive how this model with the deletion refolds in 3D space based only on the physics of polymer phase separation. And so you can compute the map of the contact predicted by the theory after this deletion. And now it's clear that in principle, you can make a real experiment in a real human patient carrying precisely the same deletion and check whether the real experiment match or not with the experiment with the, the model derived prediction. And this is a stringent test of the theory because I mean, there are no available fitting parameters. Okay, the, the prediction of the model is uh, tested against independent data and it will be simply confirmed or rejected. Again, as an example, and to cut short a very longer story, I just want to uh, discuss uh, the case of a deletion called del B plus that we made in the case of the FF4 gene. Uh, on the left, you can see the data of the FF4 region that I discussed in my previous slide. So nothing new on the left hand side of my slide. And the new things I want to discuss are here on the right. Uh, in particular, in the case of this deletion, we removed in our polymer model, this uh, gray region around the FF4 gene. We made this deletion. And up above here, you can see the prediction of the model, the, the contact predicted by the model after this deletion. So as you can see, the uh, contact map predicted by the model is different from the normal case because the model is telling us that after this deletion, there is a new specific cloud of interactions between two specific regions that I highlighted in, uh, in blue in this slide that of course were not interacting in the say normal case. And in particular, those say blue regions are really interesting from a biological point of view, because one here, this guy here, is, is an enhancer of FF4. In other words, it's a regulator of the FF4 gene, so he can activate FF4 when it comes in close spatial proximity with the gene. And the other guy is Pax3, which is a, a, say a different gene. So the model is predicting a new specific cloud of interaction between the regulator of FF4 and the different gene, which is Pax3. Now, our Mattia, colleagues in... 20, yes? 20 minutes are gone. 20 minutes are gone. Okay, five minutes still. Okay, thanks. So, thanks. Five, yeah, five, five, five minutes. Yeah, yes, yes, thank five you. Minutes for you, and then there will be questions, okay? Thank you very much. Okay, so strikingly, I mean, our colleagues in Berlin at Max Planck Institute and Max Delbruck made uh, uh, the, the experiment uh, with this deletion, but in a real patient. So they made an independent SC experiment on a, a real human patient carry precisely this Del B plus deletion, I, I'm telling you. And see, strikingly, they found the same pattern of ectopic interaction predicted by the theory. And what is even, say, not worth it, at least from my side, is that uh, uh, the considered patient is affected by a congenital disease technically called brachydactyly, which is a, a kind of malformation of the fingers of the end. And so uh, what I want to say is that uh, with those type of models, it's like that uh, uh, we are understanding why there is this mutation, because the model is telling us that because of the deletion around the FF4 gene, the regulator of the FF4 gene starts to interact with the wrong gene, Pax3, and activate the wrong gene, thus causing this pathogenic phenotype, which is linked to disease. And so the two big messages so far uh, are the following. I mean, on the one end, we are testing the model and the predictive power of the model against independent data. But on the other end, which is even more important, and if you want challenging and ambitions in a diagnostic perspective, we can use those basic models from physics and computer simulations to predict in silico the effects on 3D architecture of disease-associated mutations. Of course, we ran, uh, we, we made, performed many, many types of different mutations, not only deletions, but also the applications, inversions, not only in the human genome, but also in, in other genomes, for instance, in mouse. This is a recent work that we had in collaboration with San Diego University and Ludwig Cancer Research Institute. I don't have the time to go through the details. So again, I want to stress the message that the model is validated, but uh, what we learn from those quantitative investigations is that we can seriously use those models to make in silico prediction about disease-associated mutation on the 3D structure of the genome. In the remaining maybe two minutes, I just want to uh, quickly discuss this other work that I performed during my PhD, uh, because uh, say recently there have been, a, I mean, the last three, four years, there have been major advances also in the field of microscopy whereby nowadays we can measure quantitatively in real experiments the structure of the genome 
not only at, say, the ensemble average level, say, on a population of cells, but in single cell. So we can go beyond average interaction and see whether our mechanism of polymer phase separation is consistent with real single cell data, which is even more exciting for us as physicists. And so I don't have the time, of course, to discuss all the details of, of the paper, uh, but just want to stress the big picture. Uh, on the say in a bobby year, in, you can see real data from the real microscopy experiments. You can see population average data, such as I see, which are recapitulated by the theory, but also the patterns of interaction in single cell are well explained by the predicted conformations of our polymer model, as well as many other quantitative observables that I don't have the time to discuss, uh, were found to be statistically consistent in both experiment theory. And so we found that this mechanism of polymer phase separation can explain the contact, uh, contact formation beyond average, but at the level of the single DNA molecule. So uh, we have strong, see, quite strong evidence that this is an important player of driving chromatin folding in uh, say, real cells. Now, I just want to conclude. Those are my three, uh, say, highlighted key points, uh, because the first is the following. Nowadays, we have quantitative data on genome structure, for instance, I see, and those data are revealing that our chromosomes, our genome, have a complex folding in the, in the cell nucleus, which is linked to, of course, uh, functional purposes, such as gene regulation. There are ordered patterns of contact emerging from those data, but the mechanism underlying the formation of those contacts are not understood. So we want to use principled approaches from polymer physics to tackle this challenging, say, problem. And now we have see, quite strong evidence that a mechanism based on thermodynamic polymer phase separation can be an important player driving chromosome architecture at the single cell level. So once identified one putative, say, uh, mechanism of folding, we can use our validated theory, our, our validated polymer model to make application, to make original applications. I had the time to discuss only, say, one of these. We made many other, uh, say, uh, of course, application. But uh, one is the following. You can use your polymer physics tools and uh, say computer simulations to predict the effects on 3D architecture of mutations and perturbations. And as you understood, those mutations are not random because they involve the gene regulators. And so unfortunately, often they are linked to also severe disease. Uh, finally, I want to acknowledge Mario, of course, and all my colleagues in the group. I thank you all the collaborators in both US and uh, in Europe, and of course, thank you all for, for listening. I hope to be on time. Thank you so much. I'm trying to stop that. Thank you so much, really. Very nice talk. I appreciated it. We all appreciated it. So, uh, do you have any question? Marco. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah. Nice talk. Uh, I have a question about these colors. And so, do they represent some real different chemicals uh, in the in the binding size? Yes. Yes. This is a, a brilliant question, and and the answer is uh, is it's not obvious because, uh, for instance, this is the the colors for a, a model of a region on say chromosome twenty one, but uh, say the results are quite general. So I'm referring to this for simplicity. We found that uh, if you take the one color, say the green binding sites of the polymer model, okay, now these green binding sites do not correspond only to one specific molecule, one specific chemical species, say uh, coasing, for instance, but each color corresponds to a specific combination of different particles. So, for instance, the green sites on the polymer chain of this model is associated are associated to coasing but also to another protein called CTCF and also some epigenetic marks and histone modification. If you take the red binding sites, they are associated to a different combination of particles or histone chemical modification. So coasin and many, many other. So we think, and the impression we have is the following, is that each uh, binding domain of, of the model, so each family of the same color, say all the green binding sites of the polymer model, correspond not only to one type of molecule, but to a specific combination of different molecules. And in some cases, for instance, uh, this uh, region in, uh, in uh, chromosome 21, we also identify precisely who are those, I mean, uh, what are those particles you are talking about. So they are combination of proteins, such as CTCF and quasi, and specific histone epigenetic, histone marks or epigenetic modifications. 
Also, we are making this genome-wide. This is the project of my colleague Andre Esposito, and uh, we are working to extend it to infer this code. I mean, on the scale, of course, of the entire chromosome, not only specific regions. This is a very, very good, terrific question. Okay, Go by answer. You. I don't know if if this like answers. Answer, it answers. Yes, yes. So it's a it's a combination. Okay. Of um, so there is a code. I mean. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Any more questions? <laughs> Any questions? No, okay. If not, you know, we can thank you again. And we can thank both of you for uh, being so nice to give us so very nice talks. And uh, hi to everybody. See you soon. Arrivederci. Grazie. Thank grazie you. Grazie mille. Ciao, grazie.